2024 is officially upon us and winter has already given us a few kicks with some frigid temps, snow, and most recently we had some ice. But we're not gonna let that keep us out of the game. With a new season and a new year comes a brand new set of top 10 comics on a budget videos. And we're diving into the new year in style with our top 10 comics on a $100 budget list for the winter of 2024. So whether you've got a little Christmas money that's still burning a hole in your pocket, or you're pre-planning on how to spend that income tax return, let's hit the back issue bins and see what we can dig up for a hundred bucks. Kicking off our list is a book from a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. Star Wars, Heir to the Empire, number one. Cover dated for October 1995, Heir to the Empire number one is on a return trajectory after getting hot leading up to the Ahsoka Disney Plus series. The primary reason for this is one of the first appearances within the issue, that of Grand Admiral Thrawn, a cunning and dangerous leader in command of a portion of the fallen Galactic Empire's forces. Thrawn was created by writer Timothy Zahn in the original novel, but here the story is adapted by writer Mike Barron and the interior art is by Olivier Vettin. The painted cover, which is quite easy on the eyes, I'll give it that, is from Mathau Lefray. Another notable first appearance in this issue is that of Mara Jade, the wife of Luke Skywalker. As part of the Star Wars Legends catalog, Heir to the Empire is not technically canon, but the spin-off universe is clearly a source of material for Star Wars canon currently. At its peak during the comic book boom of the summer of 2021, a 9.8 copy of this nearly hit $2,000, but that same 9.8 is averaging a sales price of just $577 in the most recent 90 days. The real appeal for this one is for high-grade raw copies, which have now fallen back to the $100 price range, making this issue one to consider if you are a fan of the Ahsoka show or even just Thrawn himself. Fighting for truth, justice, and the American way, but of the Marvel variety, Captain America is no slouch when it comes to having some iconic covers for collectors to chase down. One of the title's best covers came at the tail end of the Silver Age in the fabled Summer of 69 with July 1969's Captain America number 115, our number nine book. On the inside, this issue sports a classic Red Skull story from Stan Lee and artist John Buscema, but the eye-catching Marie Severin cover features the Red Skull wielding a cosmic cube to imprison a seemingly defeated Captain America. This cover has always been a favorite of mine, and I was lucky enough to pick up a gorgeous Mile High 2 copy of this one a couple of years back. Another notable thing Cap 115 has going for it, it's the final 12 cent issue of Captain America. With the recent pullback in comic book prices, low level keys like this book have been selling at rather affordable prices. Mid-grade raw copies have been routinely selling around the $50 mark, while very fine copies have been selling for just a few dollars more. There is a bit of volatility in recent sales, but for our $100 budget, you should be able to pick up a very nice raw copy of this late Silver Age gem. In 1998, Kachihira Otomo's Akira sprung from its manga beginnings and onto the silver screen with an animated movie and an American comic book adaptation of the original 1984 manga, which was printed by Epic, a prestige format or graphic novel imprint that Marvel operated in the 1980s and 1990s. But as all things do, Akira ran its course and was canceled. Our number eight book is the second to last issue of the series, Akira number 37. One of the things you'll notice after you've been in the hobby for a bit, or you've completed a number of comic book runs, oftentimes the later issues can be challenging to track down. Publishers rarely cancel books that have steady or growing readerships, which typically means that there are fewer copies of these later issues in circulation. And this is 100% the case with Akira 37. And this issue is also the second most valuable in the entire run, behind only the following and final issue number 38. Akira is a massively important work that played a large role in introducing manga and anime to the American market. And with manga's rise in popularity, along with rumors of a new film adaptation in the works, interest in the series has been increasing in recent years. With its general level of affordability and a modest 38 issue run, Akira makes for an appealing series to collect if manga or anime is of interest to you. 
In the current market, a high-grade raw copy of Acura 37 can be picked up for $100 or less, with multiple sales coming in around $80 or $90. For our number seven book, we're going to keep that same theme going. That theme being a harder to find late run issue. In the number seven spot, we're dropping in on the end of the G.I. Joe run with G.I. Joe number 149. Here's the lay of the land for this series. Debuting in June 1982, Marvel's G.I. Joe, a real American hero as it's officially known, would run for a total of 155 issues ending in December 1994. Most of G.I. Joe's animated contemporaries, titles like Thundercats, Care Bears, and the Masters of the Universe wouldn't receive comic book adaptations, at least not with Marvel in the case of Masters of the Universe, until the mid-1980s, and when they did, they were relegated to Marvel's children's imprint, Star Comics. The G.I. Joe title would outlive the Star imprint by six years, as it went defunct in 1988. G.I. Joe 149 has a couple of things going for it. First off, beginning with issue 148, there's a general level of scarcity for the final eight issues of this series. And to go along with that scarcity, you slap a Phil Gosier Baroness cover on the front, and you've got yourself a winning combination. G.I. Joe legend Larry Hama scripted the issue, which also featured Gossier interior art. Surprisingly, issue 149 is one of only five issues of G.I. Joe to check in with values above $50. Currently, it's selling for upwards of $75 for high-grade raw copies, and this one rarely trades for less than $50 above mid-grade, thanks to its harder-to-find status. And now you know. And knowing is half the battle. It's hard to believe, but we're living in a world where some of the best-known comic book characters are careening towards their 90th birthdays. Superman will hit 90 in 2028, Batman in 2029, and Captain America and Wonder Woman in 2031. And it's these last two that set the stage for our number six book, as in the early aughts, cover artists for both characters made use of a particular cover design that's not only awesome, but it paid homage to the character's longevity and growth over the decades. For Cap, it was Captain America Volume 5, number 14, with its Epting and Schomburg cover, but our number six book is Wonder Woman number 184, which is rocking a fantastic modern and retro mashup cover from the one and the only Adam Hughes. Published in October 2002, Wonder Woman 184 is the cherry on top of a fantastic run of covers Adam Hughes turned in during his time on the title, which spanned from December 1998's Wonder Woman 139 to December 2003's Wonder Woman 197, give or take a few issues where he had a month off. Unlike Captain America 14, this era-spanning cover appears to be all original, whereas Epting used Schomburg's cover for Captain America Comics number 27 as the background in that particular example. Now, kudos are due to Hughes for not only sticking the landing on his fantastic modern design, but he also really captured the Golden Age World War II era DC vibes for the base layer of this cover. While a small selection of Hughes' Wonder Woman covers have hit the $10 to $20 price range, Wonder Woman 184 is currently commanding upwards of $80 to $90 for raw copies recently, but a pair of graded sales in 9.4 and 9.6 in just recent days for a few dollars more than that may be the better bet if you're so inclined. Thundering its way to the number five spot is a late stage Silver Age classic from the God of Thunder himself, Thor number 150. Remember back in the day when MCU movies were all the rage and having a character involved in an upcoming movie instantly sent their key issues to the moon? Yeah, I mean, me too. But unfortunately, we've been on the return trajectory from the moon for quite a while at this point. And while that sucks a lot if you FOMO'd into a book like this at the peak of the market, there are a lot of great opportunities out there for books like Thor 150 today. With Hela being the main baddie in Ragnarok, all of her key books shot up, and while this issue is not her first appearance, hell, it's not even her second appearance, that would actually be Thor 133, this is Hela's first ever cover appearance, and holy crap, is it a good one. I have a few loves in my life. First up, it's Mrs. Como, then it's my dogs, but right behind other things like family and friends and, and all that stuff, 
is Silver Age Red, Yellow, and Purple. And with that in mind, I think Thor 150 makes the top 10, maybe even the top five of the greatest red Silver Age Marvel covers, period. Here's an obvious statement about this cover. Jack Kirby killed it. Shocking, I know. As for the particulars, this one was cover dated for March 1968 and featured the classic Marvel creative team of Stan Lee and Jack Kirby. With where prices currently are for this issue, you should be able to pick up an upper VF or lower near mint range raw copy of this one for a hundred bucks, no problem. Unless your seller is reliving those old glories by keeping the boom prices alive here in 2024. One of the more interesting characters that's been getting some attention lately is that of DC's Element Man, Metamorpho. There's been more interest in that character and his first appearance in Brave and the Bold 57 since the James Gunn DC reveal than at any time I can recall since I've been in the hobby. And while the train has already left the station for Metamorpho's first appearance, his second appearance in Brave and the Bold number 58 is our number four book. Second appearances are one of our favorite budget-minding collecting targets, as you know if you followed the channel for very long. Cover dated for February and March 1965, Brave and the Bold was in kind of a weird place when this one was released. Originally starting out as a sword and board adventure title, Brave and the Bold would switch formats, and for a few years it would actually mimic DC's showcase title, where it became a springboard for new characters and stories. Here's a quick rundown of B and the B's biggest debuts. Suicide Squad, Justice League, Silver Age Hawkman, Silver Age Hawk Girl, the Teen Titans, and then finally our featured character, Metamorpho. By the time issue 50 rolled around, the book would test out its long-running gimmick as a team-up book for the DC Universe, and following issue 60, it was full steam ahead with the team-ups for the rest of the series run. Brave and the Bold 58 has a Ramona Fradden cover and interior art, which was paired with the Bob Haney story. Mid-grade raw copies can be had on the cheap right now, but a high-grade copy should run you between $75 and $100 in the event you're able to track one down. Currently, eBay is a little light on inventory, but if a graded copy is more your thing, a CGC 6.5 is available at a $99.95 buy it now price. But with only 113 copies on the census and an extremely light number of comps, I'm more inclined to think that being patient and hunting up a high grade raw copy for the same money is the better value at this point. A collectible reprint just sounds like an out of place phrase in the comic book hobby. But we're living in strange times and you may be surprised to see how many reprints are starting to gain a decent amount of value. Our number three book is a great example of one such book, Marvel Tales number 106. Marvel Tales began all the way back in 1964 as a square bound annual that reprinted some of your favorite Marvel characters first appearances from the beginning of the Marvel Age, including Spider-Man, Thor, and Iron Man. This hodgepodge of Silver Age Marvel reprints would continue through issue number 27, with Spider-Man then being given a double billing, beginning with issue 28, and it was topped off with a single other story, which was typically a Doctor Strange story reprint from Strange Tales. Though that arrangement was short-lived as well, by February 1972's issue number 33, Marvel Tales was all Spider-Man all the time. Fast forward a little over seven years, and we get to the Marvel Tales reprint of one of the biggest Bronze Age issues of Amazing Spider-Man, that of ASM 129. The first appearance of the Jackal and some guy named the Punisher. One of the most appealing things about Marvel Tales reprints is that they often retained the original cover art, but would feature updated colors. And to be honest with you, a lot of the reprints actually have a more interesting color scheme than the original books. Marvel Tales 106 is very faithful to the original cover of ASM 129, with one really striking difference. Gone is the classic yellow foundation of the original Gil Kane and John Romita cover, and in its place is a bright red background. The way I see it, this book is a must-have for two kinds of fans. Punisher fans and fans of red background covers. And even if you don't find yourself in one of those two camps, this thing looks fantastic and I think it would fit nicely in just about any collection. I've sold several of these things over the years and unfortunately I find myself regretting that I never held on to a copy. 
As with most books right now, prices are a little all over the place, but generally speaking, you can pick up a copy of Marvel Tales 106 in VF range for 50 to 60 bucks, but truly high grade near mint range copies are likely going to be in that 75 to $100 price point. That said, keep an eye out for any auctions as you may be able to pick up a good deal compared to the buy it now prices. One thing we all have to look forward to in 2024 is the arrival of the HBO Max show, The Penguin, starring our favorite tuxedoed bat villain, the Penguin. Yeah, they really put a lot of effort into coming up with a clever name for that show, didn't they? Our umbrella-obsessed friend Oswald Cobblepot appeared in quite a few issues in the Golden Age before taking a bit of a break and returning in the Silver Age. But here's the problem. For four years of Silver Age appearances, the covers the Penguin was featured on never really got off the ground. That's my best penguin pun way of saying they kind of sucked. Well, our number two book turned all of that around in March 1967 with the release of Batman number 190. This is the penguin cover we'd all been waiting for. Props to Carmine Infantino for giving us this absolutely bonkers umbrella onslaught. We've got gas umbrellas, machine gun umbrellas, buzzsaw umbrellas, umbrellas with maces on them, stabby umbrellas, smashy umbrellas, and God knows what else is actually in there. Of course, this issue would have been released in the early stages of the mid 60s Batmania that accompanied the Adam West Batman TV show. And this issue 100% captures the zany vibes of the show. And looking closely, I kind of pick up on some Burgess Meredith vibes in the Penguin styling here as well. Inside the cover is a Gardner Fox story that was drawn by Sheldon Moldoff, who was ghosting for Bob Kane. While cover appearances in Batman 155 and Batman 169 predated this one, to me, this is the standout Silver Age Penguin cover. In fact, unless you look close, it's kind of tough to even notice the Penguin on the cover of Bat 155. The giant fire-breathing dragon is a bit of a distraction. Unfortunately, with our $100 budget, we're not going to be landing a near-mint copy of Bat 190. I wish we could, but that's just not the case in today's market. What you can expect to find is a collectible fine or maybe even very fine range copy if you're patient. There's no shortage of copies available for this one, so I recommend waiting for the copy that gives you the best bang for the buck. But one thing I will say is that if you do decide to go after a copy of Bat 190, hold out for a nice white copy. The colors really pop off the white background if you can find a copy that hasn't yellowed with age. And then there was one. We've reached the top of the list for the winter 2024 top 10 comics on a $100 budget. And we're gonna close this one out with a Bronze Age annual that not only features the first team up and meeting of some important characters, but also another second appearance that's flying under a lot of radars. The number one book is Marvel Team Up Annual Number One. Published in 1976, the inaugural annual for Marvel Team-Up sees our friendly neighborhood Spider-Man team up with the new X-Men team for the very first time. In fact, this is the first time Spider-Man and most of the new X-Men team members ever cross paths. Nightcrawler is the main exception here, as he had had a crossover in an earlier issue of Amazing Spider-Man. I promised you a second appearance as well, didn't I? Well, believe it or not, Marvel Team-Up Annual Number 1 is the second appearance of Jean Grey as Phoenix. The creative team for this book may seem familiar if you're a fan of X-Men stories of the time, as Dave Cockrum was the cover artist and the story was co-plotted by Chris Claremont, along with Bonnie Wilford and Bill Mantlo. The interior art was laid out by Sal Bushima and finished by Mike Esposito. Copies of this annual, they're not really too hard to come by, but as it's square bound, finding a near mint copy can take a bit of hunting. The good news is that despite the significance of this issue, MTU annuals tend to exist in a dimension that most comic book collectors rarely visit, which has kept the value of this one rather accessible. Recent high grade raw sales have been in the $75 to $90 range, with FMV for a graded 8.0, currently sitting at $85, you know, if slabs are more your thing. To me, the true selling point for Marvel Team Up 1 are the Cockrum cover and the early Phoenix appearance, even if she doesn't appear on the cover. I'm sitting here kind of feeling like my Cockrum and Claremont run 
is incomplete because I don't have a copy of this book. The longer I look at this Cockrum cover, the more nostalgic I get for it. And man, I really miss that guy and his art. It's so good to be back. I hope you enjoyed the first top 10 list of 2024 as much as I did. I actually had these books picked out a couple of weeks in advance, which is incredibly unusual for me. I wanted to also officially point out that I've slightly shaken up the schedule for the top 10 videos. In the past, the winter videos would come out before winter, and then I'd be working on the spring videos during actual winter. I decided I didn't like that, so moving forward, the videos for the season will come out during the actual season, and the big Comics to Invest in video that caps off each season will come out right at the end of said season. My thought process there is that by changing it around this way, when I'm working on that final big video, it can be a more retrospective look back on the season itself. And while we're at it, help me brainstorm a new name for the big video. The Comics to Invest in Before It's Too Late title, it's great and clickable, but I don't really feel like it represents what those videos have become, or is that just me? While investment and buying strategically was a focus of the channel early on, lately the focus has really been more on collecting and the collectability or significance of issues beyond just the value. So if you have a suggestion for a new name for what we can call the big quarterly video, leave it in a comment down below and let's see if we can maybe find a more fitting moniker. Collect responsibly, and I'll see you in the next video.